Welcome, welcome, welcome to Coastal. My name is TJ. I'm one of the pastors here. We're glad that you're with us. We had a, an incredible, incredible time on Wednesday night. If you weren't able to make it out there, we had a time of going out to our new property in Parkland, Florida, and uh, having a chance to set the tone right for what it's all about. It's about worshiping Jesus. We're not building buildings that have buildings. We're building buildings that tr can transform people's lives. And so uh, we got the opportunity to go out there and worship together, see our future space, see the walls coming up. And it's just a great, great time. In case you missed it, man, I'm sorry you missed it. But uh, the rest of us, we had a great time. So we just want to give you a little recap. With that, I, I, I told you a couple weeks ago that we'd give you a, an update on our Immeasurably More offering. Anybody interested in knowing what that was? Okay, so not really very many people, so we'll just move on. Happy Mother's Day to everybody. Okay, okay. There's a, there's a few teenagers on the front row that sacrificed and gave, and, and so they want to know what's up. And so uh, over the last couple of weeks, with, with our $100,000 match from our donor, you guys gave $240,000 towards our Measure and More project. Come on. That's a, that's a good thing to celebrate right there. I mean, that's an amazing, amazing feat. And uh, we had a goal of $250,000. So like we're right on the edge of, of being there with that. And so maybe you're out there and you're like, well, my gift doesn't matter. Listen, it does. You still can give. Man, we're believing God that he's going to do incredible, incredible things out there. And so I, I can't wait to see what God, God does through that. But uh, how many of y'all are thankful for mom today? Anybody thankful for mom? Come on. If you're not thankful for mom, that's messed up because you're, the only reason you're here is because of mom. So this is a day to appreciate. Even if you don't like her right now, you need to appreciate that woman. She went through some pain for you, okay? Pain, I'm telling you. But uh, moms, we're, we're appreciative of you. We, we, we look forward to cel celebrating you a little bit more with something at the end of our services for you. But uh, we're going to dive back in. We started a series last week called... Plan B, and we've been talking about the idea of what do you do in life when life isn't going as expected, when, when maybe the dreams that you have have shattered, maybe when you have some unmet expectations or God hasn't shown up in the way that you thought God should have shown up. And so we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 37 today. If you want to turn in your Bibles there. And if you weren't here last week, we talked about David. And uh, David's life is a lot like your life. David has a dream in his life. He has a dream of what could and should be for his life. Like many of us, we have some dreams and some goals and some aspirations in our lives. And then hope starts to rise towards that dream. Some things start falling into place in David's life, just like They've fallen into place in your life at times. You, you got the promotion you were looking for. You got accepted into the school or that person said yes to your date request on, on whatever app you're using today. And, 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 you know, it's like hope all of a sudden starts to rise in your life. But then there, there is a problem. There is a conflict that takes place. There's a threat to your dream. And in David's life, it's King Saul. Saul actually tries to kill him with a spear. And all of us have had our dream threatened at some point or another where it's going good and all of a sudden it takes a turn for the worse. It isn't going down the same path that we thought it was going to go. And it's in that moment that every single one of us has a choice, just like David had a choice, of are we going to try to uh, control and manipulate the situation, which is the choice that David made, or are we going to choose to trust God in that moment? And, and here's what I know gets a lot of us in trouble. What gets us in trouble is in the midst of our dream, when it seems like it's slipping away or it's fading away or it's not happening the way we thought it should or how it should or when it should, we have this mentality that, that we think that God should act and feel the same way that we act and feel. And so when it isn't going that way, our response a lot of times is anger and frustration. And so what we do in that moment is we want to go and control and dictate how that situation is going to go. And the big idea from last week is, is what we got to make sure that we do is we don't abandon our God-given values in pursuit of our God-given dreams. Because what happens for a lot of us is in the midst of pursuing the dream, we'll give up values and we'll compromise values. And when we compromise our values, what ends up happening is we end up living this compromised life. And so today I want to look at, at somebody from the Old Testament as well. His name is Joseph. And we're going to spend some time diving into his life. And, and just like David, Joseph had a choice in his life when his dream was not coming to fruition the way that he thought it was going to come. He had a choice of to trust 
or to try to control. And basically, if you were to search out almost every big story throughout the Bible, you would see that every single person came to this kind of fork in the road moment where they had to choose, am I going to trust God or am I going to try to control and manipulate this situation? And if anybody in life knows about shattered dreams, it's Joseph. Joseph's life was like this epic series of shattered dream after shattered dream. And, and some of you can relate because you've been there. You know what it's like to have one setback after another setback. And you, you've gone through the good news season where everything is going your way, only for it to be followed up by the bad news season of life where everything kind of just goes to hell in a handbag in that moment. And it's just crushing for you. Maybe you were praying for a particular job and, and God finally answered that prayer and you got that job and you were so ecstatic. It was like good news galore. And then all of a sudden you start working there and you realize that your boss is the biggest jerk and the dream job that you thought it was going to be ends up being a nightmare job. Some of you are like, I, I have that job right now and it's terrible. Maybe you're out there, and, and especially on, on Mother's Day, a lot, of, a lot of women can relate to this. You've been praying and believing for God for a child, and you finally get pregnant, and you're celebrating that fact. And it's good news only to a couple of weeks later find out that you've had a miscarriage. It's bad news, and it's, it's devastating. Maybe for some of you, you stood at the altar gazing into the eyes of the person you thought you were going to spend the rest of your life with, and today, you're standing in a courtroom, gazing across it at a person that you're, now is your adversary in life. Some bad news. And what do you think our response should be when we go from these good news to these bad news situations? When we go from our plan A, which was our dream, to plan B, which we never asked for, dreamed of, or even wanted in life. And I think there's a question that can lead us to some really, really deep spiritual places in life that can create a deeper intimacy with God if we can answer it properly and if we have the guts to ask it ourselves. And it's kind of the, the key thought for today. In fact, it's going to be something I'm just, going to, I'm just going to kind of pound on over and over and over again. And that's this. What would you do if you were absolutely confident God was with you? What would you do in life if you were absolutely confident that God is with you? Say your marriage is unraveling and it's, it's, it's just falling apart right now. What would you do right now if you were completely confident that God was with you. Or maybe, let's say you're a mom here today and we're celebrating Mother's Day, but you don't feel like a great mom because the kids that you raised up in God's ways are running away from God right now. What would you do today if you were completely, absolutely confident that God was with you? Or suppose you go to the doctor just for a routine checkup and you find out that maybe there's just a possibility of cancer in your life right now. What would you do if you were completely confident that God was with you? And so that's the question that we've got to ask ourselves and we have got to answer. And so we're going to dive into Genesis 37. And just so you know, I'm going to cram like 45 minutes into 30 minutes because you are the smartest church in Broward County. I couldn't do this in any other church. But you guys are so confident and so with it that we're going to do that. So uh, Genesis 37, starting in verse 3, it says, Now Israel, this is not a country at this point. This is a person. Israel is a person. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made him a richly ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to them. And so here we go. We're set up for conflict right from the beginning. We have this young kind of punk of a kid, Joseph, who is the family favorite, who's probably an antagonizer, prideful. He's got things that his other brothers don't have. And so his brothers are extremely jealous of his life. And, and, so, and so Jacob, who is Israel, Israel sends Joseph to go check up on his brothers and deliver a meal while they're out tending some sheep. This is where we pick it up in Genesis 37, verse 23. It says, so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the richly ornamented robe he was wearing, and took him 
and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty and there was no water in it. Now, imagine how jealous Joseph's brothers are and how much they hated him in order to take their brother, strip him of his clothing, and throw him in a pit. I have a stepsister. She's younger. She annoyed me to death, but I never beat her up and throw her in a pit. Anybody out there, you know what I'm saying? Like, you got to really dislike somebody for that to happen. And that's exactly what happens to Joseph. Can you imagine how Joseph felt sitting in the bottom of that pit? Can you imagine the pain of rejection he feels as, as a result of this vicious and violent act from his brothers? I bet that he's sitting in the bottom of the pit, just like you've sat in the bottom of some pits in your life, maybe not a physical pit, but a, a mental or an emotional pit, and you ask the same question that he was asking. Why me? Why me, God? Why me? Why right now? And I'm going to guess that you've been there. You understand the emotion of that, not necessarily in the bottom of a pit, but you've been in that place where it's the why me feeling, where you've been lying in bed late at night, staring up at your ceiling because you can't fall asleep going, God, why me? Why my life? Why my situation? Why now? And I'm going to imagine that in the middle of sitting in that pit, he probably screamed out, God, where are you? And why have you abandoned me? And I've just found that when life isn't turning out the way I thought it was going to turn out, my natural inclination and feeling is God has abandoned me. And I'm going to guess that when you're in that place, you have that same feeling, God, where are you? Why have you abandoned me? And what I've learned in those moments where it feels like I'm all alone is that God is most powerfully present when he seems most apparently absent. Because God is always working, even when we don't see the activity. God is always moving through our circumstances and our situation when we can't see him, when we can't feel him, when all the circumstantial evidence says something differently. God is still at work and he is powerfully present. And so his brothers sell Joseph into slavery. And so we pick it up in chapter 39. It says in verse 1, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian, who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered. And he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. Now, I don't know if you caught this or not, but there is a statement in this story that just kind of messes with me. And it's this statement that it says, the Lord was with Joseph. It says, the Lord was with Joseph. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait a second. Wasn't Joseph just beat up by his brothers? Wasn't Joseph just thrown in a pit? Wasn't Joseph just sold into slavery to the Ishmaelites and then resold into slavery to Potiphar? I mean, wasn't, if the Lord's with him, like, what's up with that? Because for me, I've always had this, this idea in my mind, and I'm sure you have too, that if the Lord is with me, then life is going to turn out good. Like if the Lord is with me, I'm going to get in the school of my dreams. If the Lord is with me, I'm going to go down that career path that's going to be absolutely incredible, and God is going to open up door after door. If the Lord is with me, the hottest girl in the world is going to marry me. Oh, she did. Okay, if the Lord is with me... <laughs> I'm going to be successful in everything I put my hand to. If the Lord is with me, my kids are going to be perfect. If the Lord is with me, I'm going to get everything I've ever dreamed of. Come on, is anybody with me on that? I mean, internally, I think we all kind of sort of have this, this internal agreement this, or, or like this contract with God. God, listen, if I live somewhat of a holy life, you are now obligated to bless me in everything I do. Am I the only one that feels that way? No. Y'all are laughing, but you're like, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> like, and, and nothing bad is, like, God, I kept the contract, nothing bad. There's something bad, a contract. It's like, here's what I've discovered, and you're probably not going to like this. The person that God is trying to create you to be does not come by success 
then success, then success, then success. The person that God is trying to create you to be comes from success, failure. Success, heartbreak. Success, pain. Success, let down. Continuing in verse 3, it says, When the master saw the Lord was with him, that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and entrusted to his care everything he owned. See, his master starts to notice there's something different about this kid. And, and, and so he promotes him. And I think it's really, really important for us to note that in the middle of your shattered dream and unmet expectation, how you respond to your shattered dream and unmet expectation matters in life. Notice that Joseph is not trying to run away from Potiphar. Notice that Joseph isn't whining about his situation. Joseph isn't going, man, a month ago I owned slaves and today I am a slave. Notice his attitude attitude is positive. He is serving in a Christ-like way, so much so that his master notices that his attitude is better than everybody else's, and that his work is better than everybody else, and he gets promoted. See, Joseph may have been stripped of his coat, but he was never stripped of his identity. He may have been beaten and abandoned by his brothers, but his relationship with God was never abandoned in that moment. And even though life was turning out completely different than I'm sure he ever assumed it would be. He's making a choice to respond in every circumstances as if God is with him. And when you're in the midst of adversity and when you're in the midst of your dream slipping away and you're in the midst of, of it seems like earth-shattering pain, you only have one assignment on this earth to do what anyone would do that was confident that God was with them. See, as a pastor, the most asked question I get, and I actually got it yesterday, once again, two, two Brazilian guys came over to my house, and they asked this question. They asked, what's God's will for my life? Like, where, where am I going? Where am I supposed to be in life? And... Uh, if you want to know God's will for your life, I know the first step to that. The first step is, is know God. You want to know God's will? Know God. You want to know what the second step is? I don't have a clue what that is, so go back to step one. See, we all are concerned about what's happening to me. When is this going to be over? Why is this happening to me? And Joseph isn't concerned about any of those questions. See, what we often miss in the middle of our shattered dream and unmet expectation is the fact that our journey is more about who you're becoming than where you're going. All of us are so concerned about, like, where, where is this taking? Where am I going? Where? And God is not concerned about where you're going. He's concerned about who you're becoming. And who you're becoming is determined by, do you know God and are you focusing on that? Are you confident that he is with you? Because if you're confident that he is with you, then you know that good is going to turn out from this. Continuing in verse 6, and it says, So he left in Joseph's care everything he had. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well-built and handsome. Sound like anybody you know? Don't know who it was in your mind, but after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing? Now, this situation alone makes me makes like Joseph the biggest hero in my book because without an accountability partner, without a, a church family, without a Bible, without the Ten Commandments, without, without a connect group that he's involved in, this guy is able to, to abstain from what most people would fall into. And, and he actually states, how could I sin against my God who I would be thinking in the back of his mind is going like, who hasn't really done a whole lot for me lately? 
Why in the world would he declare that kind of commitment to God? When it appears as if God has abandoned him. And somehow, this 20-year-old kid has something we often miss. Because his responsibility was not to re organize his circumstances. His responsibility was not to try to control and manipulate what he could not control or manipulate. His responsibility was simple, but it was not easy. And it was, what would anyone do if they were completely confident that God was with them? And let's be real honest in here. Isn't it hard to remain faithful to God when it feels like God hasn't been faithful to you? It's hard in that moment. And honestly, some of my biggest spiritual regrets have come in those moments where, where I feel like God was supposed to do something right there, or I thought he was going to do something, and he didn't. And in essence, I kind of gave him the spiritual middle finger and said, God, I'm going to go take control and do it my way. Because I felt like he wasn't there. And I've just learned that every day, you and I, we have a choice. We can make choices based on our interpretation of our circumstances. Things are bad and they're getting worse. Or I can make a choice based on God's promises that he is with me. And my responsibility is just to live believing that he will take care of it. And that's exactly what Joseph did in verse 10. And it says, And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. One day he went into the house after his duty, to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants were inside. She called him by his cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called to her servants, Look, she said to them, This Hebrew has been brought to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. And Joseph is framed and sentenced to prison for the thing that he had the courage to not do. This is a situation in the Bible and in life where I'm like, Come on, God. Seriously? Like, I did the right thing, and it turned out terrible. Can anybody relate to that? Like, come on. Like, I've done everything right, and, and you're supposed to be, I mean, I prayed, I fasted, I said the right thing, I did the right thing, and everything fell apart. What's up with that, God? I mean, you were, you were faithful to your spouse, but yet they still cheated, right? I mean, you, you tithe regularly, and you trusted God with your finances, but yet you still went bankrupt, you prayed for your kids every single day that they would, they would follow God's ways and they're straying. You were loyal to that company for so many years and they still fired you. You were pure in your relationship and they still dumped you. And for most of us, it's frustrating because we think that if we're doing the right thing in life, our life should end in the right way. Come on. I'm doing the right thing, so it should happen this way. I read this great quote from A.W. Tozier a long time ago. It's from his book, The Pursuit of God. It says, There's within the human heart a tough and fibrous root of a fallen life whose nature is to possess and always possess. It covets things with a deep and fierce passion. The pronouns my and mine look innocent enough in print, but their constant and universal use is significant. They are verbal symptoms of our deep disease. The roots of our hearts have grown down into things, and we dare not pull up one root lest we die. Things have become necessary to us, a development never originally intended. God's gifts now take the place of God, and the whole course of nature is upset by this monstrous substitution. He says God's gifts take the place of God, and, and I think that it, as you listen to that, that describes so many of us, doesn't it? Quite a few years ago, my, my wife's sister, 
Shelly had a baby, his, and, and she had a, a little boy named Avery. And at, when Avery got to be three or four years old, I, I decided I was going to take him on an uncle, nephew kind of uh, fun day. And so we decided we we're going to go have some fun. We went to Chuck E. Cheese. Chuck E. Cheese is a great place to take kids if you want to spend a lot of money and be annoyed by like stuff going off all the time. But one thing I learned at Chuck E. Cheese is you don't eat at Chuck E. Cheese because Chuck E. Cheese has the worst pizza in the world. Can I get an amen, parents? Worst pizza in the world, overpriced and terrible. And so we went, to, we went to a great place instead. We went to the golden arches of McDonald's because McDonald's, for some reason, like, is like heaven on earth to kids because it's a happy meal and you get a toy, right? That's what it's all about. It's all about that toy. And so we were there. We were eating a happy meal. I got him some like Mountain Dew. I was sugaring him up. I'm like, I'm going to hook mom up. Like, good uncle, man. And, and so we, we ate. He ate fries and Drank Mountain Dew. We went outside and played on the playground where you used to be able to get hurt. You know, now everything's safety. It's no fun anymore. You, it's not fun unless you can get hurt, Mom. Um, and so we're playing, and, and man, he's, he's like, he's riled up. He's like, I'm like, I'm going to give you a Snickers and one last Mountain Dew, and then we're done for the day, okay? Uh, and as we're walking inside, he sees another kid who has just gotten a Sunday at McDonald's. And, um, and, and so I'm trying to get him to leave. And, and he's like, I want a Sunday. I want a Sunday. And I'm like, dude, you, you, we're not getting a Sunday. You're going to get a Snickers and Mountain Dew. You just don't know that yet, you know? And so, and so he's like, I want a Sunday. And I'm like, dude, we're, we're not getting a Sunday, bro. Uh, like, I'm putting my foot down right now. And he starts screaming at the top of his lungs, I want my mommy! Not once, but like on repeat. It's like it got stuck on the CD player. I want my mommy! I want my mommy! Just like over and over again. I grabbed him by the neck. And, no, I'm just kidding. You're like, that is the worst parent ever. Yes. Uh, no. What I learned in that moment is that Avery didn't want his mommy. He wanted what his mommy, he thought his mommy could give him. And I hate that about me and my relationship with God and my worship and my prayer and my service. Because the reality is, is I don't really want God. I want what I think God can give me. In fact, a lot of times, just call it what it is, I want God just to be my cosmic vending machine that whatever button I push pops out what I ordered. Verse 20, it says, Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. Gosh darn it, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. Now, if, if I'm Joseph at this point, I'm thinking like, listen, God, I'm glad you're with me. Can you go be with somebody else? Because it hasn't done me a lot of good. <laughs> like, like uh, you were with me. I got beat up and sold. You were with me. I got thrown in prison. You were with me. I, I, I thought it started going good. Now it's bad again. Like, I don't want to know a warden. Go help somebody else know a warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and God gave him success in whatever he did. Do you know what Joseph did while he was in prison? He did what anyone would do if they were confident that God was with them. And here's what Joseph knew that for some reason is so hard for you and so hard for me. And Andy Stanley, Stanley says it like this. It is only when we trust and look for God in the circumstances that we find him. It's only when we res respond to our circumstances as if God is there that we see God in them. It's only when we expect God that we experience God in our lives. Isn't that so true? When we're not looking for God, we don't see him anywhere. It's only when we start to look for him and pursue him and expect him that somehow, some way, he shows up and shows off. In Genesis 40, it, says, it tells us Joseph makes a couple of friends. He makes friends with a wine tester and a baker. They have these incredible dreams, and Joseph interprets them. For the baker, it's not a very good dream. He's going to die. For the wine tester, it is good news. And so Joseph says, man, I just have one request from you, wine tester, in verse 14, 15. But when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. 
Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of prison. For I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. And this is the first time we see in Joseph's life where he's saying, hey, guys, this, this isn't right. And basically he says, can you do me this one thing? Can you remember me? In essence, he's going, God, if you could just do this one thing, and we've all prayed that prayer, right? God, if you can just give me enough money this month to pay my rent, I will serve you all the days of my life. God, if that girl would just say yes to my date request, you will be my Lord and Savior. God, if you will just give me a child. God, if you'll just mend my relationship with my mom. God, if you'll just help me break this, if you'll just do this one thing. And this is exactly where Joseph is at. Man, you'll just do this one thing, and the wine tester is like, yes, I'll, I'll take care of you, bro. Three days later, the wine tester is freed. And then in verse 23, is one of the most depressing verses in the Bible. It says, the chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. And I'm sure in that moment, Joseph was thinking, after all I've been through, God, I've been faithful. I've done it the right way. All I asked for was the wine tester to remember me. That's it. And some of you, you can relate because you've been haunted by the thought that God could have done something, but he didn't. In fact, some of you are in that place right here and right now. And here's why that's important, because if that has not happened to you yet, it's not that it won't, it's it's that when. All of us are going to face that moment where you're going to feel like, man, I'm praying and I'm asking God to do something, and it seems like every prayer is bouncing off of the, the bottom of heaven and just coming right down on me and that dream that I have and that expectation that I have are slipping and nothing. And it's in that moment that every single one of us have got to make a decision and this decision will have the largest implication on how we process life. And that's, are we going to put our faith in what God does or who God is. See, we've got to choose to put our faith in God's identity and not his activity. But yet so many of us, we're putting our faith in his activity and when we don't see him moving in that moment, we're throwing up and going, why? You're going, why am I going through what I'm going through? I don't know. Will this ever end? I don't know. Am I in God's will? I don't know. Will this be over soon? I don't know. Will how I respond make a difference? More than you will ever know. See, what does someone do when they're facing some shattered dreams? It's all about, are you completely confident that God is with you? Are you completely confident that God is with you in your marriage? Are you completely confident that God is with you in your your career? Are you completely confident that God is with you in your parenting? Are you completely confident that God is with you in your finances? And when things start to go awry, here's what you need to do. You need to take a step back. And you need to take a deep breath and not just say that you're confident, but actually start to live out that confidence and live out what you actually believe. Because belief isn't lived out through your words. Belief is lived out through your actions. And here's what you'll find when you start acting as if God is with you, you'll find that God is most powerfully present when he seems so apparently absent. 
And all the setbacks that you've been experiencing are just setups for the incredible life that God is preparing for you. Would you guys bow your heads and pray with me? God, my prayer today is that for every single person that's in this room, God, that you would give them a confidence to trust you today. God, no matter what their circumstances, no matter what their situation, no matter what what life and everything around them says, God, that you would give them an internal confidence that they could not find anywhere else but in who you are. It's not based on your activity. It's based on your identity. And God, this is what I know is that you are for me and not against me. God, that you have made me the head and not the tail. That you have brought me to be above and not beneath. And everything that you want me to do, God, you want to prosper in my life. But some of the prospering is internal. It's about development. It's not about where I'm going. It's about who I'm becoming. And you're trying to develop some things so that when you do take me towards my dream, I can actually sustain that dream life. And so, God, I pray right now that we would not try to control and manipulate, but, God, that we would trust. And maybe you're here today and and you've never taken the first step of trusting, and that is putting your confidence in a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about rules or religion or membership at a church. I'm talking about a relationship with the creator of the universe who loves you so much that he died on a cross for your sins and for mine. And maybe you're here today and you need to experience that. I'm going to ask Pastor Josh to pray for you here. Yeah, if you're here today and and you've never given your life to the Lord, if you've never committed your life to Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. It's the best decision you could make. And so with, with every head bowed and every eye closed on the count of three, if you just slip up your hand, I'd love to pray with you. One, two, three. Yeah, hands going up all over the room. Yes, thank you. I see you. Yes, thank you. Let's pray together. If you'll just pray this in your heart as I pray it aloud. Say, Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. I recognize that I'm not perfect and that I don't have it all together. But Lord, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. And I'm choosing today to follow you and trust you with my life. And I pray that you would begin to change my heart from the inside out. I thank you for what Jesus did on the cross. I thank you for the power of his resurrection, promising me an eternity with you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Wasn't that a great message, church? Come on, let's give it up for TJ.